A young man with black hair stood and pondered what would happen if he could start over in the face of a hopeless situation. What choices would he make, and how would his life turn out? The young man stood in the barn with a large knife, and at his feet lay a blindfolded cow, perhaps to prevent her from seeing her fate prematurely. It was unclear why the young man decided to take this step when he loved his cows so much. A man and an elderly woman stood watching discussing the incomprehensible thoughts running through the boy's mind. Did they really want to slaughter their own cows? What a waste, considering how much the young man cherished them. It was completely baffling what had come over the boy today. He had already raised the knife to the cow's head. He seemed to have gone mad, holding the knife above with a calm and resolute face, ready to strike. But something stopped him. The girl flicked her lighter and lit a cigarette, which began to smolder slowly, filling her lungs with the smoke of tobacco. The young man turned around and glared at her angrily, as if she were the main problem and the cause of all his troubles. And the cause of his troubles turned out to be a beautiful girl, in a lovely blue miniskirt and a black top that barely covered her shoulders, revealing the sexy straps of her black bra. The girl continued to blow out cigarette smoke and, pointing the cigarette in his direction, started talking to the boy, saying that they should pretend yesterday was just a joke. Even if the boy carried out his plans with his cows, and even if he gave her $100,000 as a dowry, she still wouldn't marry him, and he shouldn't dream about it. The young man looked at the girl's beautiful blue nails and the smoldering cigarette, which burned like his love. The girl kept telling him that he wouldn't succeed, that her younger brother had already promised her $200,000 as a wedding gift, along with a car. And if the boy were left without his cattle, what would he do? She suggested burying that thought and forgetting about it. It was easy for her to say, but what if the boy's feelings were genuinely strong? The man who stood and observed this was surprised that the boy wanted to do this because of the girl and called him a fool. She wasn't worth it. The grandmother supported the man, saying that there were many unmarried girls in the village, and he should find another bride. But the boy didn't want to listen to anyone. He was determined and ready to do anything for his love. He turned to the people and asked if they were finished gossiping, and if so, they should leave and not waste his time. The girl flicked her cigarette and ostentatiously began to walk away, telling the boy that she wanted to help make things better but he didn't appreciate her kindness at all. The young man turned around to savor her beauty once more, watching as the girl distanced herself, while a man and a woman approached him, apparently to talk. Someone called out to our hero, and he turned eagerly, not expecting to see the person who called him. It was his parents who called out to him, and they were not impressed with what he was about to do. His father told him that if he had problems, he should talk about them and his mother begged him to put down the knife and not do anything foolish. The young man's hands relaxed and dropped, and he seemed to realize the foolishness he would have committed if it weren't for his parents. They were able to calm him down, and perhaps the pain would fade away for a while. The young man approached his parents, hugged them tightly, and expressed how happy and relieved he was that they were alive and well. Well, it seemed that even the parents themselves didn't understand what danger they had been in. A fat, bald man watched this scene with a malicious grin, asking the family if he had accidentally stumbled upon a TV show. No one paid him any attention, and the young man with a confident face began to assure his parents that this time he would definitely protect them from anything. He started shouting for the whole street to hear that no harm would come to his parents, and he would also protect his older brother and sister. Mom was extremely worried about her son, not understanding what was happening to him. She looked at him with teary eyes and tried to figure out how she could help her son. Father's face was completely covered in sweat from anxiety, and he wiped it with a white towel he had on his shoulders. He didn't understand what harm his son was talking about or what was threatening them. The son lowered his head to the ground and began to convince his parents that he hadn't gone crazy and that they needed to deal with those cows to prevent any harm. What kind of harm was supposed to happen? What was the reason behind his actions? He couldn't explain. 
He looked at his parents and asked them to trust him for once in their lives and do as he asked. If they truly loved and respected him, the parents looked at each other and understood each other without words. Father approached his son, exhaling nervously, while the mother raised her hand and started saying something to her son. Father bent down to the ground and picked up a knife, saying, I don't know what you have in mind, son. And the father walked towards the cows, talking to his son, mentioning that he was a university student, which meant he was smart and had much more knowledge than them, and that he understood something. The son looked at his father with a hint of trust, and couldn't even imagine what would happen next. And a second later, the father raised the knife up with his right hand while embracing his son with his left hand, completely unaware of what was happening. After all, the father had never acted so strangely before, nor had he ever supported his son to this extent in his endeavors. The woman let out a heavy sigh and watched as her son and husband walked away. She realized that she couldn't do anything about it and they would do as they saw fit. That very grandmother who had tried to reason with the young man spoke to the mother of the family, urging her to enlighten her family since the father and son couldn't go crazy together. The mother glared at the old woman and told her that she was the one who had gone mad and shouldn't meddle in her family's affairs. The family reunited and the mother also decided to support her husband and son, disregarding public opinion. It was the right and sensible decision. People continued to discuss the family behind their backs. Apparently they had no problems of their own and were mostly interested in the problems of this family. They were very eager to know why this family had gone mad and understood the girl who had left the boy. After all, who would want a lunatic as their husband? The boy unlocked his phone screen and saw that it was already 17 minutes past three, which didn't please him. He realized that time was running out. He looked at the cows in the pens, already understanding their fate, and told himself that he had less than four hours left and he needed to hurry. The boy raised his hand and loudly shouted that he needed three people to help him slaughter the cows. He hoped for a prompt response. The people he called out to didn't pay attention but as soon as he mentioned money, their eyes lit up. They were ready to do anything for money. They started running towards the boy, tripping over each other and boasting about who was better. Each of them wanted to earn money and show that they were superior. Two boys stood out in particular, one with white hair who claimed to be strong and capable, and another with dark hair who assured our hero that he was the best choice. Our hero didn't care who would help him. The main thing was to get the mission done quickly and without any trouble. He pondered for a moment and raised a finger to make his choice. He chose those very impulsive boys. They looked at each other, and a spark of rivalry ignited between them. And the chubby boy standing behind them, who hadn't drawn much attention, was also given a chance to earn some money. Nervously twirling the phone in his hand, our hero watched as his parents and the three boys who wanted to earn money dealt with the first cow. He felt sorry for the animal, of course, but time was ticking and he had no other choice. He took the phone and pressed a peculiar button. His fingers trembled with excitement, causing him to barely hit the screen. It turned out that someone had called him, or he had called someone, but it was somewhat unclear. He was asked if he could sell everything for cash, to which our hero replied affirmatively, saying that it was very urgent, and if the buyer was genuinely interested, he could sell everything at half price. He mentioned that if they took everything at once, he could give them an additional discount. Apparently, he was in a dire situation since he almost begged the person to buy something from him. The car was driving through the city, raising dust in its wake. In the trunk, there was a bundle wrapped in blue fabric and tied with ropes to prevent it from falling apart. A red bag with white and blue stripes fell to the ground with a thud. He was ready. He had no choice. The young man stood there counting the red bills, known as money, and deeply lost in thought. His parents tried to ask him something, but he didn't react at all. He was too absorbed in his own thoughts. With a very sad face, his mother told him that she had done everything as he had asked, and their family had incurred losses in tens of thousands. She didn't understand if such losses were justified. 
The son unzipped the bag, revealing the stack of red bills. There were too many of them. He ran his fingers through them, assuring his father and mother that the risk was justified and they would soon understand everything. He slung the bag over his shoulder and approached the car. He asked his relatives to hurry back home and not to show themselves until he returned. He instructed them not to open the door for anyone and not to leave the premises. These were the last instructions he gave to his parents. His parents looked at him, tears welling up in their eyes. They believed in their son wholeheartedly, but they couldn't even imagine what he had planned. Their worry had no bounds. The mother remained silent, while the father told his son that he had never been wrong before and that he would succeed no matter what. The young man opened the car door and threw the bag full of money inside. His parents murmured something behind him, but they spoke very quietly, and our hero could only hear that they trusted him very much, but could only support him at the moment. The son sat behind the wheel and closed the door, ordering his parents to trust him, lock the gates, doors, and windows, and not to venture outside. He repeated this for the tenth time, but he was extremely worried about his parents, so he would repeat it a hundred times if necessary. The car sped off, and on the clock it was already eleven minutes past five. Our hero was deeply afraid of being late. From the bridge he was driving on, he saw his city for the last time. But he was not interested in it anymore. His thoughts were consumed with where to stock up on weapons, medicine, and ammunition. How many months' worth of grain supplies did they have in the cellar? He drove the car with one hand, the other resting on the armrest. His gaze was contemplative, and he knew that true chaos would begin in two hours. Now it was up to us to understand what this chaos entailed. And here is what it entails. Suddenly all animals, including livestock, mutate for no apparent reason. They become vicious and bloodthirsty, attacking humans. Those bitten by the animals start experiencing the same symptoms as the animals. And in this madness, people will lose their sense of pain and only crave flesh. If you get bitten or scratched, infection is inevitable. As a result, over the next month, more than half of the earth will become infected. They will be everywhere, and within a year, fewer than a million people will be left alive. It's hard to imagine since the earth's population is 8 billion, and within a month, it will shrink to 1 million. Our hero remembers how in his previous life he panicked when faced with this situation and couldn't save his mother, brother, sister, or father. That's what it all comes down to. Our hero has arrived from the future to correct the mistakes of his past. He didn't intentionally arrive in the past, but since he has a chance to fix everything, why not give it a try? I think every person has dreamed of going back in time and correcting something. The car continued to speed through the city, as our hero contemplated preventing the tragedy from happening again and saving as many people as possible. With all the money he earned from selling cows and his other belongings, he bought various items in the city, more specifically a diesel generator and a fuel reserve. He purchased all sorts of cables, flashlights, ropes, batteries, chainsaws, axes, shovels, and other defensive tools. He also bought a large quantity of emergency medicine, painkillers, antibiotics, and gauze bandages. These were the things he took the most. Lastly, he left the most important purchase for the end. He went to a factory with huge production pipes. At this factory, he intended to buy gunpowder. With his bag, he tried to enter a certain door and realized that if he managed to buy gunpowder, they would soon be able to seize the initiative in the early stages of chaos with firepower. He eventually managed to enter the room where a man was sitting on a chair, crossing his legs, and next to him stood an elegant girl who was likely his secretary. Their faces were in shadow, and the room was too dark to make out their features. But the man's face illuminated, and he clasped his hands under his chin, addressing our hero, saying that the security checkpoint had already informed him presumably upon seeing the large bag on the young man's shoulder, and asked if he came for a major deal or just casually. Perhaps he was just the secretary's friend. Upon hearing these words, the secretary blushed and looked down. The young man slammed the bag on the table, making a loud noise, 
thereby showing the seriousness of his intentions and making it clear that he had not come here to joke around. He gave a stern look to the man and confronted him. Our hero had come to discuss matters, and after a long pause he mentioned the man's name. His name was Lin Jay. He unzipped the bag, revealing stacks of red banknotes. He told the man that inside the bag were a hundred thousand in cash, showing that he wasn't joking. The man looked at him with an unsatisfied gaze, even with a gaze full of contempt, and questioned the young man again if there really were a hundred thousand there. Apparently, he found it hard to believe that someone could have such an amount of money. He turned to the secretary, who was already restless, and asked her if she had said anything before. What she said, to whom, and why she said it, he didn't specify. The man burst into laughter. His eyes rolled back and his mouth unnaturally widened. He laughed at our hero, calling him too naive and amusing. In a moment, his face changed and he grinned maliciously, exposing all 32 of his teeth. He said that Li Chin had mentioned that she wanted a ransom of a hundred thousand, and did the boy really manage to gather the entire amount? The girl called the man, sir, and said that everything wasn't as he understood. She stated that she had absolutely nothing to do with the young man. Well, our hero shattered all the girl's rosy dreams that she meant something to someone. After a pause, he pointed at the bag of money and told the man that he was giving him the money to buy black powder. The man clasped his hands together, forming a little house. Apparently, it was his favorite hand position. He asked the boy if he was really joking with him. The man said that they had a serious production, and he wouldn't push his product in the wrong direction. After all, it could cost him his life as well as his career. Our hero knew the sore spot he could press. He said that he didn't know about illegal trading, but he knew that in December of last year, a girl in a blue dress died at a forest factory owned by the man and perhaps she could shed some light on what was going on. The man understood that the boy knew a lot and that he had two options, either do as he requested or quietly eliminate him. The young man handed over the money and said he would buy the gunpowder. After all, they both had their cards up their sleeves, and it was best not to create a commotion. The man looked at the boy and realized he had no choice. He called for his secretary and asked her if he remembered correctly that they hadn't yet approved the quarterly report. The girl stood there, not understanding what was happening. An economic crime was taking place. The man mentioned that the weather promised to be humid, and who knows what could happen with the gunpowder. He wanted to write off the gunpowder and give it to the boy. That's what he ordered the secretary to do. The girl had no right to refuse and agreed to carry out her boss's orders. Fear filled her mind, the fear that now illegal gunpowder trading was tied to her. Our hero stood confidently, not even turning to look at his beloved as she exited the office. Apparently, she was the least of his worries at the moment. The boy looked at the man and said that Uncle Lee had taken good care of his family and that they were very grateful. The boy said that if anyone was in trouble now, he would definitely help them and made a promise. The girl watched the unfolding events with a sad gaze and couldn't leave the office. I didn't understand her behavior at all, but every woman has her own quirks. Our hero reached out towards the man who was ready to sell him the gunpowder, seemingly expecting a firm handshake as they bid farewell. But from the man sitting on the chair with his legs crossed, there was absolutely no response. He had no intention of showing respect to the foolish boy, he simply sat there, lost in thought about something interesting. His eyes glowed with a devilish red color, and his wide smile revealed his devilish grin. He had something in mind, but we would soon find out what it was. There was a very strong wind, and the trees swayed, risking breaking. Our hero's car pulled up to the door of a house, and its trunk was full of various things— the hero stepped out of the car, closing the door, realizing that he had arrived just in time. There was half an hour left until the end began, and for now, it was quiet. He slammed the door loudly and started calling for his parents, hoping that they were okay. At first there was no reaction, but then shouts could be heard from behind the gate. Someone shouted that they were coming to our hero. The gates opened, and a young boy peeked out. His expression was not very pleased, and he asked our hero what was wrong with him today. 
As it turned out, these two boys were brothers. Our hero was delighted to see his older brother, but the older brother was very unhappy that the younger one had sold all their livestock without consulting him. Our hero had no intention of justifying himself to anyone, and his brother was no exception. The boy went to the car, saying that he would explain everything later. He asked where their younger sister was because he missed her so much, to which the older brother replied that the sister had not yet returned. Our hero's breath stopped for a second. His heart beat even faster and a sharp pain pierced his chest. Could his sister be in danger? How could she still not be home? In his previous life, at this time, his sister was already home. Our hero apparently didn't know about the butterfly effect, and this effect was happening right now. Even the slightest changes in the past, and not only in the past, can alter the course of events. Our hero's face became covered in a sticky sweat of fear. The boy swiftly opened the car door without even realizing it and told his older brother that he would quickly go and get their little sister. He turned to him and shouted that no matter what happened, they should not leave the gates. He said he would fetch their sister and come back. The brother tried to stop him from the open gates, but the car had already rushed forward, leaving behind only plumes of smoke mixed with dust. The older brother, looking at those brown clouds, managed to say only that his brother should return soon and unharmed. The car sped at a tremendous speed across the bridge, illuminated by a beautiful sunset. Our hero held onto the steering wheel tightly, trying to get the maximum out of the car because every second counted. He looked at the road, but his thoughts were elsewhere. He recalled that on the first day, it was the animals that turned into zombies, there were few mutated humans, and the school was located in a city where the danger was much higher than in the village. If his sister was still at school, irreversible things could happen. Our hero promised himself that this time he would not let any of his loved ones die. He was so lost in his thoughts that he didn't even notice a dog or perhaps a wolf suddenly darting across the road in front of his car. Breaking at the very last moment, he still couldn't avoid the collision and the animal was thrown away from the car. All that remained was a bloody fountain in the air. Our hero hit his head hard on the steering wheel. There would probably be a bump at the point of impact. The car left behind a very long skid mark and the animal's body was scattered all over the road. Our hero touched the sore spot on his arm and tried to understand what had happened. But then his gaze caught something terrifying. He looked in horror at what was happening on the road. The creature he hit didn't die, but, on the contrary, gained a new life. It was a zombie dog. Everything started much earlier than last time, and our hero realized that he had less and less time, maybe no time left at all. The events take us to the school, where we are about to hear what happened there an hour ago. Three students sitting at their desks were discussing our hero and couldn't understand how he could do such a thing. How could he sell all the family's livestock for a girl? To the children, it seemed very foolish, but they didn't yet understand why he did it and what danger awaited them. The girl raised her phone, saying that it was the number one news in the whole district. The girl turned back to the girl who was sitting and diligently writing in her notebook. This girl was our hero's sister, who was being severely bullied for what her brother had done. So the girl who turned to her asked if she was ashamed of her brother. Our hero's sister was a smart girl and understood that there was no point in responding to provocative questions. She simply continued silently writing in her notebook. But her classmates wouldn't calm down. The girl said that the girl for whom the livestock was sold now works at a fireworks factory, and her brother has completely lost his mind as well as their whole family. Our hero's younger sister, tired of hearing this nonsense, stood up from her desk and was probably ready to leave the classroom. Her classmates continued to taunt her. That same girl showed her a photo of her brother on her phone and said that her parents allow him to do such things. The sister hit the hand of the bold classmate, who continued to say that their family had gone insane and knocked the phone out of her hand. The phone fell to the floor, bouncing several times before stopping and falling. The owner of the phone jumped up and took a fighting stance, apparently preparing to seek revenge for her phone. Our hero's sister headed towards the exit of the classroom, no longer wanting to listen to this nonsense. She had had enough. 
but that bold classmate didn't intend to let her go and asked where she was going. Someone started picking up the troublemaker girl's phone from the floor. The teacher entered the class, and our hero's sister deliberately began to speak loudly about the phone. She apologized for her carelessness and for dropping the girl's phone. She promised to return the phone to her right away. <laughs> oh, The teacher looked displeased at the situation. Our hero's country was incredibly smart if she had come up with such a plan. She drew the teacher's attention to the phone, which was prohibited in the school. The teacher said that the school rules state that phones are not allowed, and apparently the previous confiscation of the phone didn't teach the girl anything. She went to her desk with the phone, telling the girl that she would now report this situation to her father and return the phone only to him. The teacher ordered our hero's sister to return to her seat and not disrupt the lesson. The girl was very pleased that the troublemaker had been punished. She passed by her tormentor, smugly saying that she was sorry that things turned out this way and that she didn't know the teacher would come so early. She knew everything perfectly well and that was the essence of her plan, but she needed to rub it in the face of her tormentor. The troublemaker girl only made a dissatisfied grimace, since she understood that it would be better not to do anything in her situation. Rain drummed on the school roof, trying to play some interesting melody. People opened colorful umbrellas over their heads to avoid getting their work clothes wet. However, these people didn't understand that very soon they might not need those clothes anymore. But retribution apparently came to our hero's sister, and she sat on the floor after hitting her head against the classroom wall. As it's easy to guess, the culprit of this flight was the same troublemaker girl who said that our hero's sister was very brave recently, but now she was suddenly silent. She grabbed her by the hair and tried to lift her up, intending to inflict as much pain as possible. She wanted to hear an explanation from this wimp, or even better, receive an apology. Tears welled up in our hero's sister's eyes. If only she remembered that she was supposed to be on duty with her today, then she wouldn't have done that to her phone. The girl took out a utility knife and extended the blade, probably to scare her, or maybe she really had evil intentions. With one hand, she grabbed our hero's sister by the head, and with the other, she started bringing the knife close, saying that if she remained silent, she would open her mouth herself. Our hero's car raced down the wet street, and he hoped to make it on time. The school was very close, and he kept glancing at the time on the dashboard of his car to always be aware of what was happening. At one moment behind the wet windshield, he saw something that made him horrified and stunned. People were rushing out of the school, pleading with everyone still inside or near the school to leave quickly and save their lives. Inside the classroom, a utility knife fell to the floor with a distinctive sound, next to a pool of blood. Our hero's sister had a satisfied look in her eyes and her face was stained with blood. Her tormentor sat on the floor, covering her mouth with her hand. Blood was flowing out, which could stain her pristine white shirt. Apparently, there was so much blood that the girl choked on it and started spitting it out on the floor. Our hero's sister watched her without an ounce of pity or remorse. The tormentor got what she deserved. The girl asked her if everything was all right, although the amount of blood indicated that things were not particularly good. Our hero's sister stood up and started running towards the exit to quickly escape the crime scene. Her tormentor continued to pour blood onto the floor. The girl ran out onto the school balcony and started shouting that there was an injured person inside the school building, bleeding profusely, and that she urgently needed help. But outside, nobody paid attention because the street was filled with people's screams caused by zombies feasting on flesh. The girl looked at this scene, not understanding what was happening. She was facing a danger she couldn't even suspect. If she had turned around, she would have seen a student who had been infected and was eagerly staring at her, seemingly anticipating the taste of her flesh. The zombie lunged at the girl. Just a while ago, it was an ordinary student, but now it was a merciless zombie with demonic red eyes and green skin. It stuck out its tongue towards the girl, ready to include her in its ranks. The girl sat on the floor, and the zombie flew over her, apparently not expecting such a move. She covered her ears with her hands, hoping it would help, and the zombie would leave her alone. At that moment, another zombie, the one who had tried to bite our girl, crashed to the floor with a distinct sound.
But that was only half of the problem because the tormentor appeared in the doorway, but now as a zombie. She noticed our hero's sister and her red eye lit up. She couldn't take revenge as a human, so maybe as a zombie she would exact her full revenge. Our hero's sister didn't understand what was happening and began to step back in fear, begging her classmate not to touch her, as she was still so young. The classmate attempted to touch her with her hands, but the girl shielded her face from the zombie's repulsive hands. But the zombie classmate had no intention of stopping and continued reaching for our hero's sister's eyes with her hands. In a few seconds, something irreversible could happen, and our hero would blame himself for it for the rest of his life. The school building was filled with rain, and the sounds of wild screams of fear and hatred echoed from within. Our hero's sister was saved by her brother, who managed to kick away the zombie classmate at a distance with a well-timed kick. The girl was in complete shock from what was happening, and her brother's unexpected appearance shocked her even more. But the zombies were not giving up. They were gathering strength for a new attack. Our hero tightly gripped a machete in his hand, offering the zombies a peaceful retreat or a dismemberment. The zombies chose the second option, and one of them headed towards our heroes. As promised, its head ended up separate from its body. With a swift motion of his hand, or more precisely, the machete, our hero severed its head. The brother looked at his sister with a gaze full of love and understanding. He knew he had made it in time. He said he came to make fun of his sister and save her. The girl blushed deeply and didn't say anything in response to her brother, tears welling up in her eyes. Outside, undeterred by the rainy weather, the zombies continued to roam and search for their victims. The unstoppable process had been set in motion. The weather outside was not improving, but fortunately, it was not getting worse either. The pouring rain continued unabated. On the road lay the body of a girl in a pool of blood being gnawed on by a zombie. At one moment, the zombie was distracted from its engrossing activity and noticed a car approaching from behind. It decided not to run, a decision it would regret within seconds. Whether zombies are capable of regret remains unknown, but the car hit it from behind, sending it flying through the air. Only bloody traces remained in the air and on the bumper. The girl sat in the front seat, buckled up, and absent-mindedly tried to wipe the blood off the window. Of course it was impossible since the blood was on the outside, but the girl was so lost in her thoughts that it didn't matter to her. Suddenly, she looked at her brother and started shouting with joy. She drew attention to herself to ask her brother a question. With her innocent face, she asked her brother if all this resembled a zombie game, and if it was all real and the kick he used at school seemed like a superhero's strike. The girl was propelled far away from the impact of the kick. This question infuriated her brother, because how could his sister compare a genuinely life-threatening situation to some game? Without taking his eyes off the road, he told his sister to stop asking silly questions, and if she was scared, she should just cry. He would understand and wouldn't laugh at her. The girl fell silent and didn't reply to her brother, or rather, she didn't know what to say to him, as he had recently saved her. The car traveled the same road as in the morning, but now the world situation was completely different. How quickly life can change. The brother started talking to his sister and told her that with each passing minute, there were more and more zombies devouring people in the world and they needed to learn to adapt to it and to keep on living no matter what. He lovingly looked at his sister and assured her not to worry because he would always be by her side to protect her. Their family would be safe and everything would be fine. He made that promise to his sister. The sister smiled radiantly, closing her eyes with joy, and she was glowing as she said she believed her brother. Night fell and the full moon sparkled in the sky. The city was still awake and many windows were lit, it makes you wonder if everyone already knows what is happening. Our heroes knocked on the gate, and a frightened family opened it for them. The parents were overjoyed that their son and daughter had returned unharmed. Our hero looked at his parents with a weary gaze and asked them if everything was calm and if nothing happened while he was away. To which the mother, 
embracing her daughter, said they had recently heard screams outside, but she and her father hadn't dared to go out. Now everything seemed quiet. Our hero pondered and diverted his gaze from his parents to immerse himself in his thoughts. He remembered that in his previous life in the village, there were very few people left, and the mutated ones feared the sunlight. So, they had enough time to prepare defenses for now. But their main task remained to survive the night. Our hero's older brother asked why he had bought so many things. But then he realized that it all seemed like a disaster. Closing the car door, our hero told his older brother that all explanations would come later. And for now, all the men in the family should help carry everything from the pickup truck into the house. And they should hurry because the main phase of zombie activity was about to begin. Our hero showed the machete strapped to his belt to his relatives and told them that, no matter what happened, they must guard the house. He would be away for a short time and would return soon. The mother was deeply worried about her son, and her expression changed instantly. She didn't want to let him go, but her daughter insisted that the mother shouldn't interfere because they needed to listen to their brother since he was able to foresee this catastrophe. The sister, it seemed to me, began to suspect something, but she didn't show it. Perhaps she was the only one who understood that her brother was behaving differently than usual. Memories from school started coming back to the guy, and he realized that his sister's intuition was not lying. His body behaved differently at school, and now was the perfect time to test it. Our hero was leaping across moonlit rooftops. He believed that amidst all this chaos, he should find someone with the same abilities as his previous life. That would give them an advantage and increase their chances of survival. A grand mansion illuminated by the moon was shown to us, where someone was shouting that they couldn't take it anymore. Some people, seemingly insane, were banging on the windows of the house. Behind those windows stood a beautiful, long-haired girl, trying to hold back the onslaught of these people. She screamed that they needed to hurry, and she knew they were worried about their loved ones. But the zombies were about to break through. The girl was right, and a glass shattered near her face, revealing an inhuman hand emerging from the hole. Two men armed with wooden clubs stood there, waving them and saying they found weapons, warning the stranger to leave. The girl stepped away from the glass and decided to leave all these questions to the guys who were already prepared. Suddenly, fear flashed in her eyes as she looked towards the wall she had just left. The wall collapsed, and hordes of bloodthirsty zombies poured out from behind it. The guys stood there, watching everything in complete shock, paralyzed and with diminished chances of survival. One of the zombies fell to the ground, apparently breaking its neck upon impact, as the fall was accompanied by a distinct crunch. After that fall, the zombie didn't get up anymore. The girl turned around to look at the zombie, making sure it would no longer pose a threat to anyone. She looked towards the wall and couldn't understand how such a thing had happened. The zombies that were supposed to tear them apart suddenly turned out to be dead and no longer posed any danger. The reason for this turned out to be our hero, who climbed over the zombie corpses with his faithful cleaver. The men looked at him, their mouths agape with surprise. It was the same fool who sold the cows for the girl. The man with glasses even adjusted his glasses to get a better look at him. Our hero gave the girl an angry glare as if he wanted to incinerate her. The girl widened her eyes, not understanding what was happening. The guy scared her a lot. Another moment and the girl would have been dead, but her life was saved by our hero, who swiftly reacted and decapitated the zombie that threatened her life. In one swift motion of his cleaver, he sent the zombie's head flying and blood fountains scattered across the room. The girl squinted in surprise trying to remember her hero's name. The guy grabbed her face as if he wanted to kiss her and answered her question with his gaze. He squeezed her cheeks and, upon closer inspection, realized that she was the same girl whose body was not infected and she could be useful to him. The girl resisted such treatment and didn't understand what the guy wanted from her. And the guy remembered that in his previous life, this girl was Jia Bin Bin, a ruthless zombie destroyer with a massive rifle. Now she looked nothing like herself, and that needed to be corrected. Terrified, the girl recoiled from the guy, thinking he was a pervert and that something bad would happen to her. 
Out of politeness, the guy asked if she had any wounds or scratches and if she had been bitten by any zombies. The girl replied that no one had bitten her and she didn't need any help. An elderly man watched our hero, not understanding what was happening. He was completely different from himself. The guy with glasses grabbed a bat and stood up in defense of the girl. He told our hero that if he had any grievances, they could discuss them, but resorting to violence, especially against women, was unnecessary. The guy stood up and closed his eyes thoughtfully, saying that he had killed Uncle Nu and Brother Juan. Well, as he explained, he didn't kill them. After all, he killed zombies. It's hard to believe and hard to understand, but they were no longer human. They had all turned into zombies. If zombie blood gets into your bloodstream, you'll immediately become like them, with no chance of a cure. The guy in glasses began yelling at our hero and telling him not to mess with their heads because zombies don't exist, and it's something from comics. The man in glasses noticed a body lying in a pool of blood and said that our hero had just killed Jang. His granddaughter didn't come back from school today, and his wife isn't responding. Could they all be? Before finishing his sentence, the man fell silent. All the men in the building looked at each other, and the eldest among them suggested calling the police. Our hero said that there's no point in calling the police if they won't be able to help. Moreover, most likely many policemen have already turned into zombies. Suddenly someone clapped loudly and asked everyone to pay attention to him. It was the gunpowder seller with his signature hand gesture. He talked about not trusting a killer. He stood among the crowd with his loyal secretary standing behind him. He said that this boy has taken a dozen lives and now claims that the police won't help. All the people began raising their hands, chanting that he needs to be caught and that he's a murderer who should be punished. Our hero stood in shock, watching all of this, realizing that he couldn't overcome such a large number of people, and if they wanted to capture him, they would definitely succeed. The gunpowder seller stood there, telling our hero that he wouldn't be able to explain the existence of zombies and justify his actions. The townspeople chanted to tie him up, saying that a killer has no place here, and the village authorities will decide for the residents. Well, the girl whom our hero saved tried to stop this chaos. She asked everyone to stop and listen to her. The girl placed her hand on her heart, perhaps to make her words sound sincere. She said that their committee would help everyone, and the criminals wouldn't go unpunished. But the guy with the sash is absolutely right. Angry villagers attacked them, and he had no other choice. Our hero wasn't completely satisfied with this outcome, but he could at least thank the girl for trying to do something to justify him. The guy shrugged his hands towards the crowd and said that he would prove to everyone that it's a zombie and that he seems to have an idea where the family members of all these people are. People stood there, looking at each other, not fully trusting the guy. And he said that anyone who would go with him would believe his words. The guy looked at the gunpowder seller and told him to come with him. After all, Lin Je doubts him. Our hero can show him everything. The gunpowder seller nervously adjusted his tie, apparently deciding to take this scary step. The eyes of Lin Je were filled with contemplation. He believed that this guy was too suspicious. Earlier in the day, he had stocked up on a large quantity of supplies and gunpowder, and in the evening, all these strange things started happening. Whatever the case may be, if our hero knows about the incident with the girl in the woods, he must take that secret to the grave. Our hero stood there, spreading his arms, continuing to convince people that zombies exist. He said that in the village, a bunch of people disappeared out of nowhere, and the place is very remote, surrounded by forests. The guy approached the gunpowder vendor closely and kept pressuring him. If the gunpowder vendor considered him a killer and believed that zombies don't exist, then it wouldn't cost him anything to go with him. Or did he actually get scared? Linja continued to make excuses. He said that he was just an ordinary person from the common folk and feared such a cruel killer like our hero. They stood there, looking at each other while the gunpowder vendor continued to speak. He couldn't disgrace himself in front of the people and said that for the safety of the village residents and to determine the whereabouts of their missing relatives, he was obligated to go with him. But he would bring a couple of trusted individuals with him. He said these words and smirked, 
showing his gang of thugs standing behind him. The girl our hero saved, sensing that the gunpowder vendor had something bad in mind, decided to go with them. However, her friends didn't think the same way. A man in a white shirt said that it was too dangerous, and the guy with glasses said that they shouldn't act rashly until they figure out what's going on. The girl looked at the men with disdain and said that since they were members of the village committee, they were obligated to take the initiative if the village secretary wasn't with them. The guy observed the situation from the sidelines and out of curiosity asked where the secretary had gone. As it turned out today, after lunch, when news started coming in about the missing villagers, the secretary went out to search for them and never returned. The guy with glasses lowered his gaze to the floor and said that his wife had also disappeared, and there had been no news from her for a long time. Our hero contemplated something, realizing that his suspicions were correct and that there were already a lot of zombies in the village, and the zombies that made it into this house were just a small part of the whole problem. The guy with glasses gathered his courage and said that he would also go with them because they had to fulfill the duties of the secretary in his absence. The man looked at our hero, apparently sensing trust in him, and said that they needed to carefully investigate everything. An elderly man also decided not to stay on the sidelines and said that he would help them. He would provide a place for the people in this building. He suggested using two vans at the entrance to reach their destination. The events moved to the forest, where the entire group of people who didn't believe in our hero was inspecting a white car. The girl examined the car with a flashlight and realized that it closely resembled the secretary's car. The elderly man touched the hood with his hand, and, based on its temperature, understood that the engine had been turned off recently, which means that the secretary was somewhere nearby. The young man with glasses tried to call the secretary, but the phone was unreachable. Once again, our hero immersed himself in memories from the past, realizing that the previous wave of zombies started three days later, and they were heading in this direction. Back then, there was no opportunity to investigate the source of that horde. If the timing coincides with the past, they would be able to solve the problem of that horde now. But his main task was to gain the trust of the girl who could greatly help him in the future. The guy told everyone that they were in the right place and that they now needed to venture deeper into the forest and be observant. The group of people started searching, combing through the entire forest in search of the secretary. From a bird's eye view, the flashlights they were using to illuminate the forest were visible. The girl walked ahead, shining her flashlight in front of her. The forest was too dense and the heroes moved forward for a long time but didn't encounter anyone. Their spirits began to drop, and it affected everyone. Well, not for our hero. He stopped and said that not long ago there were many people in this forest. He had seen traces on the grass, broken branches, and bloodstains. All of this indicated that zombies had been here very recently. It was a typical zombie movie plot, but this was only the first day of the apocalypse, and everything was happening too fast. There had to be a reason for it. Our hero stood at the entrance of a cave, shining his flashlight deep into it. He stopped the people following him and told them that there was a cave ahead, but it was too dangerous for everyone to enter together. He would go first to check it out. But the gunpowder vendor stopped our hero. He looked at him skeptically and said something very interesting. What if there was a crime scene inside the cave and our hero wanted to go alone to cover his tracks? <laughs> A pause fell over the crowd, and everyone stood silently, shining their flashlights into emptiness. Our hero let out a frustrated sigh, expressing his anger at the behavior of the gunpowder vendor. He said that he resembled a cowardly little dog that didn't trust its owner. With a look of hatred and disrespect, our hero stared at the gunpowder vendor and offered him to come along if he wasn't afraid of death. He hoped to see a mountain of corpses inside the cave. Linja understood that the guy wasn't joking, and thoughts began to creep into his mind that the guy really intended to kill him. It only made things more interesting and intrigued him. The gunpowder vendor looked at our hero within the walls of the cave, genuinely curious about what this cave concealed and how our hero was connected to it. Just a few minutes passed when a zombie hand protruded from the cave. 
A zombie girl in a ballet dress moved towards the people standing at the entrance of the cave. The guy with glasses looked at her and recognized his wife, although she was no longer the same. The girl approached the guy with glasses, and he, in turn, pushed the baseball bat back to tightly embrace his wife. He asked her how she ended up there and told her how he had been trying to reach her for half a day and was very worried. Our hero shouted at him not to approach her, let alone touch her. Well, it was too late, and the wife of the guy with glasses had already opened her lifeless mouth and was ready to devour him. Our hero, as always, reacted lightning fast, and instead of his husband's neck, the zombie wife bit into his blade. Our hero told the man that his wife would never be the same again and that he'd better stay away from her. In front of the guy with glasses' eyes, our hero destroyed his wife. There was nothing else he could do. How could he explain this to a loving husband? The man with glasses looked at all of this, and tears welled up in his eyes. The person he loved so much lay on the ground, lifeless. His life had ended now. The shock passed, and the man called our hero a ruthless killer and begged him to return his wife. Well, he didn't understand that this killing was done for the better. Everyone looked at the grieving husband and sympathized with him. No one would want to feel what he was feeling right now. The man in glasses grabbed a bat and swung it at our hero, seeking revenge for his wife. Our hero was not that simple, and with a single blow, he sent the husband to the ground. How could he not understand that his wife was a zombie and there was no other choice? The man lost his glasses and lay on the ground, listening to our hero's words about how it's normal to get angry, feel hurt, and have regrets. No matter how he felt, it didn't change the fact that the woman had become a zombie and our hero had to kill her. Blood dripped from our hero's machete. And with each passing second, the chances of many people surviving grew slimmer. Our hero could only hope that those who were still alive had not perished. The man in glasses refused to back down, and striking the ground with his hand, said that our hero was talking nonsense and such a thing couldn't happen. His wife was his loved one and she couldn't become a zombie. Our hero would have spoken to him differently if the man in glasses had killed his loved one before his eyes. Memories resurfaced in our hero's mind. His family lay on the ground in a pool of blood. It was the most terrifying memory of his life. He asked the man in glasses what he had just said, but not hearing a response, he turned away. He grabbed the man by the throat, lifting him into the air, apparently wanting to strangle him or simply teach him a lesson. He asked the man if he had been too polite with him and perhaps he should be tougher. Our hero himself expressed a desire to take them there to dispel doubts and even saved the man's life, and now he was receiving such gratitude from him. It irritated him greatly. The man hanging in the air began to suffocate. Our hero told everyone that anyone who dared to harm his family, even with a finger, would be immediately killed. Friends of the man in glasses rushed to his aid, telling our hero to let him go. The gunpowder seller started telling everyone that he was right and that our hero was indeed a ruthless killer and there were no zombies. But suddenly our hero's brother jumped towards him and tried to save the man from the hands of his own kin. He ordered his younger brother with cries to calm down and be gentler. The older brother was not left with any options, so he forcefully hit his brother's head with his own. The man in glasses finally fell to the ground, finally able to breathe fresh air. His life was saved. The older brother sat beside the lifeless body of his restless younger brother and began to stand up. Our hero regained consciousness and recognized his tormentor in the face of his brother. The older brother looked at him with a look of admiration and called him a fool, but he was glad that he had regained his senses. He extended his hand to his younger brother and said that he was not supposed to be home and everyone was getting worried. The man in glasses continued to cry on the ground, blaming himself for his wife's death for not being able to protect her. The older brother of our hero approached the grieving husband, trying to cheer him up. He said that even though he didn't want to admit it, deep down he understood that his wife couldn't be brought back. Although his brother was a fool, he had saved the man's life. The man's feelings were, of course, understandable, and the brother offered to hate him instead of our hero. He extended his hand to the man in glasses and said that they had to keep living and that he was needed by the villagers. The man started to get up, saying that he had to save the people in his village. 
Our hero looked at the whole scene and understood that his older brother, despite being different, was always ready to come to his aid and bring comfort. Although they were brothers, their characters were different. The older brother had always been popular, while our hero never had any friends. No matter what happened, the brother was always there, protecting and helping our hero. Our hero approached his brother and the grieving man and hit his brother on the shoulder for no apparent reason. He began to walk away, mentally telling his brother that it was his time to protect. From the cave, a wild scream could be heard, indicating that not all zombies had left. The girl, upon hearing the voice, immediately recognized its owner. It was the voice of the secretary who urgently needed help. She was about to rush to assist when our hero blocked her path, telling her not to act rashly. Strange sounds continued to emanate from the cave. The ward of the gunpowder cellar stated that it was true. There were zombies, and that the girl was indeed a zombie. To this, his owner said it was all nonsense and that he would go there to prove that there were no zombies. However, one of the brutes stepped forward, apparently trying to impress his owner, and said he would go into the cave. The man entered the cave and started shouting at the one who was supposedly playing pranks, telling them to come out and stop scaring people. Suddenly, his flashlight slipped from his hands and the man disappeared from sight. Everyone was bewildered and didn't understand what had happened. Perhaps only our hero understood what was going on. Inside the cave, only the lower half of the man's body remained. The upper half of the man's body was held by a zombie, surrounded by a massive crowd of its kind. Those who didn't believe our hero could now see with their own eyes that he was right. Glava 6, the zombie stood and held the upper part of the minion's body by the head. It was a very terrifying sight. Nobody wanted to look at it. After a couple of seconds, the zombie threw the upper part of the body onto the street and everyone present there was very frightened. The gunpowder seller didn't understand what was happening and fear appeared on his face. Nobody understood what was happening, and the zombies, in the meantime, rushed towards the people. Our hero looked at the crowd of zombies and couldn't understand why there were so many of them. He thought there would be fewer, and he already wanted to run away. But he realized that his brother and the girl who mattered to him would stay here. Running away was not an option. He shielded the girl and told her to stand behind him because it was the safest thing she could do right now. Someone grabbed him from behind by the shoulder. It was his brother, who frightened our hero greatly. The two brothers scattered the zombies in different directions, helping each other and complimenting each other very well. The older brother looked at our hero and was deeply hurt that he wanted to take all the glory of victory for himself. Real brothers don't do that. Real brothers always share. The zombies began to rise from the ground to continue fighting and destroy the human race. Our hero's brother was very unhappy that even after his attacks, the zombies could still stand up. He didn't understand their weaknesses and how to defeat them. Our hero looked at his older brother and reminded him that the weak spot of the zombies was their brain, as well as sunlight. The older brother completely lost his grip and forgot such elementary things. The two brothers stood side by side with the girl standing between them. The older brother said that he would definitely have enough strength to defeat the zombies, and he didn't need any special methods to defeat them. Our hero said that in that case, they would act in an old-fashioned way. The girl looked at the two brave guys with astonishment as they decided to destroy the horde of zombies with their bare hands, without anyone's help. The two brothers stood and discussed the plan of action. The older brother intended to fight the zombies in hand-to-hand -hand combat, while the younger one had a machete, making it much easier for him to destroy the zombies. The zombies glowed with their red eyes and opened their foul-smelling mouths, apparently wanting to bite our heroes, although it was clear that it was their only desire. Our hero's older brother commanded him to attack and rushed forward. Our hero flew down from the air towards the zombies while the older brother attacked the zombies on the ground. Blood was flying everywhere as well as zombie heads that were being severed by the machete. The zombies seemed as if they were not going to give up and wanted to continue fighting, expressing it with their angry growls. But the older brother of our hero stopped that growl. Our hero landed on the ground, and his brother, leaning on his back with his hands, made a very cunning and elaborate strike that the zombies 100% did not expect and were defeated by. 
From the cave, more and more zombies were flying towards our heroes. They seemed endless and would never stop. Our heroes were ready to fight and would not retreat until they destroyed every single zombie. Our hero, with a knife in hand, commanded everyone to gather together and shine flashlights in the zombies' faces. And if the zombies got closer, they were to hit them on the heads. But most importantly, they must not let the zombies bite them because a person immediately turns into a zombie after that. On another clearing... An elderly man and a man in glasses stood next to three corpses and were talking. The man in glasses said that the two of them barely had enough strength to kill one, while the brothers were annihilating them in whole hordes. The man couldn't understand how they managed to do that. The elderly man said that these two had been studying martial arts since childhood, and even professional fighters couldn't defeat them, let alone a bunch of dead creatures. The man in glasses agreed with him and said that he never wanted to kill our hero and now realized his mistake, wanting to apologize to him. Together with his brother, our hero destroyed a lot of zombies and stood on their corpses. The older brother spoke to his brother about how amazed he was at the amount of strength his brother had gained. Our hero said, Maybe I can arrange a master class specifically for my older brother. Our hero turned around and looked at the girl who was very scared of everything that was happening. He reassured her and said that everything was fine. The girl believed him. She stood among the two brothers and nervously exhaled, grateful to them for what they had done for her. <laughs> the older brother said that there was no need to thank him because it was his younger brother who constantly protected her. Our hero decided not to listen to this and waved his hand as he started to move away from his brother and the girl. Joe says he wants to see if the others are okay and leaves. Mr. Lin's subordinates were bitten by zombies and could turn into them at any moment. The men did not want to die and called the boss for help. Before they turned into zombies, they were killed by Joe, and Lin heard their screams while hiding behind a tree. He was scared and hoped that no one would find him. But the guy found him and was surprised by his luck. Joe tells the man to keep hiding and be quiet if he wants to survive. The guy left, leaving Mr. Lin by the tree. The man was afraid to make any sound and mentally planned to take revenge on the guy. Meanwhile, the survivors examined the surroundings, and Bing Bing says that she definitely heard someone's voice. The young man returns, and everyone hears a cry for help from the cave. The girl understands that this voice belongs to the secretary. Joe says that he will check who it is himself, and the rest should return to the cars. Suddenly, the older brother says that he will go with him to cover his back. The guy agrees with his brother, but tells the others to return. Bing Bing doesn't want to let them go into this cave alone, but Joe replies that they will only interfere with them, and the two of them will try to find the secretary. Uncle Niu agrees with the guy, and he tells Huang and Bing Bing that the village needs them. They began to return. The girl could not object and simply looked back. The guy wanted to prevent the zombie horde that would appear in a couple of days because he didn't want any more victims. He hoped that the girl would protect the survivors in the village. The brother asks if it is still possible to save the secretary. To which the guy replies that if he has already been bitten, then there is no way to save him. The guy says that Bing Bing came to the village as a student to become a village official and she needs the help of a secretary. Suddenly, Joe tells his brother to stop. In front of them lay the dried corpse of a man. Joe immediately realizes that something is wrong because unlike other zombies, this one has become a mummy. Suddenly, Derek shines his flashlight into the distance and finds the secretary. The light from the flashlight fell on the back of a man who was calling for help. The man was overjoyed and started shouting that everything was okay and they would save him. Saying, I'm so hungry, the man turns around and it was no longer a man but a real monster. The guy pushes his brother away from the tentacles. He realizes that the zombie is too fast and they won't be able to escape. Then he takes out a knife and makes a split-second decision that he needs to attack. The zombie continues to call for help and shout that he is hungry. Joe dodged the tentacles and came within striking distance of the knife. He hit the zombie directly in the head but did not have the expected effect. The knife was unable to cut through the head and the guy is surprised at the hardness of the skin. He immediately realizes that this is a mutant zombie in front of him. This monster attacks the guy with its tentacles and he flies back. Joe rolled on the ground from such monstrous force. The zombie wanted to continue the attack, but suddenly a light illuminated him. It was Derek. He knew that bright light was effective against zombies. 
The guy tells his brother that they need to retreat if they want to live. Miraculously, they got out of the cave and caught their breath. Derek wonders what kind of mutant this was. Joe replies that the mutation is due to infection by animals, and in rare cases, the combination of two DNAs mutates. He adds that mutants are much stronger than ordinary zombies, and some even have unusual abilities. The guy assumes that the secretary was bitten by one of the bats that was in this cave. The young man says that such zombies are difficult to fight in the dark, but they are afraid of the light and are lucky that the moon is shining brightly today. Derek wonders how long it's been since his little brother became a zombie expert. Joe replies that the books describe exactly the same thing, and they need to take equipment to kill this creature tomorrow. Suddenly, they hear the sound of cutting air. It was bats flying out of the cave, screaming. Perhaps they were flying away from someone and were a sign of the onset of something sinister. They rose like a black cloud in the sky and covered the moonlight. Suddenly, tentacles appeared from the cave, piercing the ground with a roar. It was a mutant zombie who jumped out of the cave at high speed. He attacked Derek with fury, trying to bite. Joe tried to stop the zombie by grabbing it by the tentacle. The guy understood that the zombie was very strong, and to win, he needed a powerful light source. Suddenly, a car appeared from the side from the darkness of the night. The car crashed into a zombie at high speed. Bing Bing was driving, and she suffered kickback as she crashed into a tree. Joe wasted no time in finishing off the zombie while it was immobilized. The girl got out of the car, asking if everything was okay with the guys. She was surprised that the zombie turned out to be the secretary. Derek breathed a sigh of relief after defeating the zombie, since it could have killed them both. Looking at their brother, the guy and girl couldn't believe their eyes. The man was careless and was injured by a mutant zombie. He apologizes for this and tells his brother to take care of the family for him. Joe wanted to protect his brother and did not want a repeat of the past. He felt tears on his face. He turned around, looking at the defeated zombie. A mutant zombie could control ordinary zombies, but that was not the most important thing. The most important thing was the zombie core in the back of their heads. Joe tells his brother that this thing can help while there are no symptoms yet. If he eats it now, then there is a chance of turning into a Superman, immune to the zombie virus. But the likelihood that they would not be was greater. Derek used the cannonball without fear since he had no other choice. Joe says that two days will be enough to understand whether the core worked or not. Derek goes into the cave and told them to seal the entrance if he doesn't come out in two days. But if he does come out, they shouldn't be too jealous. Finally, a smile appears on the guy's face and he says that he will wait for his return. Unfortunately for them, Lynn heard this conversation, hiding behind a tree. The next morning, their small village was calm. Zhou Ying appeared in her brother's room and was dressed in a very unusual costume. Zhou smiled and said that she looked like a weirdo. The sister says that everyone in the family should be protected, and she made this armor herself. The guy replies that this armor will not help her in any way when attacked by monsters. Walking out into the courtyard, Joe saw his father strengthening the wall. The father hugs a barrel of gunpowder and asks where his son got so much. The next moment, he runs away with her in an unknown direction, and a moment later, Joe hears the doorbell. Bing Bing was standing on the threshold, and the guy asks what she wants. The girl collected her thoughts and asks the guy to help her. She says she can't contact the local police department and the signal is gone. Joe confirmed her words, and this seems strange to him, since this had not happened in the past. The girl asks the guy to accompany her to the station, since the lack of communication may be a problem in the future. The guy agreed and they set off saying goodbye to his parents. Meanwhile, Derek was sitting alone in a cave and suddenly heard footsteps. Suddenly, some kind of liquid spread across the ground and the guy knew it. The liquid was gasoline and someone set it on fire. Sometime later, Joe and Bing Bing were driving a pickup truck along the highway. And although the girl had no hearing, she tried to sing the song, thereby calming her nerves. The guy smiled because this was truly the Bing Bing he knew in the past. The young man understood that he could not rely only on his past experience and a lot would also depend on Bing Bing. Gathering his thoughts, he invites the girl to move home with them. The girl is embarrassed and asks why she should live with him. Joe understood that if he told the girl about her future superpowers, she would not believe it. So he says he needs her, and he can't let her suffer. The girl blushes and looks at the guy with disbelief. But after a moment, paying attention to the road, they stop. The car could not drive further because the road was blocked. 
The guy doesn't remember this happening in the past. Due to the road closure, it will be difficult to bring supplies. He sighs and suggests returning to the village first. The girl agrees with him. The guy calculated that the supplies would last for some time. But the lack of signal and the blocked road gave him no rest. He had a bad feeling, which did not disappoint him. Due to punctured tires, the car skidded and became difficult to drive. Having difficulty stopping the car, they got out to look at the problem. Bing Bing is surprised by the sudden appearance of car spikes. Joe tells her to be careful and hide since these thorns were placed by a man. Lynn suddenly appears and says that he is glad to see the guy in good health. The young man asks what he wants. Lynn replied that he must avenge his subordinates. Joe says that he is not to blame for their deaths, and since he wants revenge, he must cut up the zombies. But he is too cowardly to go against the zombies. The man pointed a gun at the guy and said he would kill him. The young man was confident in his strength and that the bullet would not harm him. The villain grinned and the sound of the trigger being pulled was heard in the silence. The bullet instantly fired and whistled past the guy, and at the same moment, Joe heard a scream behind him. In fact, Lin was not aiming at him, but at Bing Bing. He did not expect such meanness and became angry with the man. Lin laughed and said that to deal with the guy, he would start with the people around him. He also adds that he heard about his brother's infection and decided to help him. Since he knew that Joe could not cope on his own and therefore blew up that cave, the guy, hearing this, ran furiously towards the enemy. Bing Bing shouted at him to stop and think about it. Lin was glad that his provocation worked, as he had been waiting for this moment. Suddenly, a huge wolf appeared from the forest, looking at the man with hunger in his eyes. Like a flash of lightning, he attacked him and bit off his hand. The guy was surprised by the sudden appearance of a rank two zombie wolf. Meanwhile, Zhou Ying was bored and waited for her brother and Bing Bing to return. The next moment, she sees Uncle Huang and Uncle Nu outside. The girl tells them that her brother left and asks them what happened. They tell her that she should look at the mountain in the distance. At first, the girl didn't understand what was going on. She took the phone to look at it in more detail. She was amazed by what she saw. A horde of zombies was approaching from the mountain. Lin wallowed in his own blood and was glad that he would not die alone today. After the first catch, the monster attacked the guy. Joe wasted no time and calmly stabbed him with the knife. Luckily, it was light and the zombie wolf was not that strong. Therefore, the wolf must die. Otherwise, when night comes, they will all die. At that moment, a strange noise began to be heard from the forest. Looking to where it was coming from, he saw a horde of zombies quickly approaching. Joe thought that since they had killed the secretary's summoner, the horde should not have appeared. But suddenly he realized that the source of the virus was not the secretary, but bats. By this point, the zombie wolf had recovered and was ready for the second round. The wolf hit the ground with his paw, and the guy was thrown into the air from such a powerful blow. Paying attention to the wound he had previously inflicted, the guy realized that the wolf could regenerate. Joe had big problems. He needed to somehow defeat this monster. Meanwhile, in the very cave in which the explosion occurred, the stones that blocked the passage flew out at high speed from some unknown force. After a short moment, the girl could not believe her eyes. She was very scared. The zombie wolf was victorious and was ready to eat the young man alive. But suddenly, the guy felt a sharp surge of strength in his body. He was pleasantly surprised to feel that power again. Having gained strength, the guy became very strong. He hit the wolf with his fist. He flew away from the large impulse. The guy in the blink of an eye found himself next to the wolf and was ready to strike. The next moment, he blasted the wolf with his incredible strength. The girl looking at this unconsciously called the guy by name. Bing Bing was surprised at how strong the young man was. She had a feeling that Joe could get out of any situation. Joe suddenly awakened his super strength, but he didn't remember anyone doing the same without activating the zombie core in the past. But he suddenly came to his senses and told the girl to get up, since they did not have time to rest. Zombies were approaching from all sides, and it was not safe here. The guy said that he would carry the girl on his back because she was wounded and she should hold on tight. The next moment, they were running away from the zombies and heading to the safe zone. By evening, they could already see the village in the distance. Looking back, they realized that they had brought a tail with them, and it would be difficult to kill all the zombies. Suddenly, there was an explosion and many zombies were killed and loud music could be heard afterwards. Their father and younger sister came to their aid. 
After some time, the car was speeding along the highway and Zhou Ying threw explosive bottles out of the window. The next second, everything lit up with a bright flame. Zhou Ying was delighted with the emotions she received. Zhou found a first aid kit and wanted to take gauze, bandages, and iodine to take care of Bing Bing. But suddenly the sister gets ahead of her brother and says that you shouldn't touch the girl's feet so brazenly. Only if they have a closer relationship so she will take care of Bing Bing herself. The young man asks his father where he got the explosives from. The man replies that he made it himself, since in his youth he was obsessed with its creation and even worked as a specialist in mine explosions. But unfortunately, after the ore was depleted and he was fired, he never touched dynamite. They finally made it home after a grueling battle with zombies. Suddenly they hear a loud scream from the house and realize that something is wrong. They couldn't open the door because it was locked, so Joe simply kicked it down with force. In front of them they saw a woman and a zombie. The situation did not seem dangerous. On the contrary, everyone was speechless at the suddenly presented picture. A woman was beating up a zombie who used to be from a neighboring village. Joe asks his father when his mother learned to fight so well. To which the man replies that in her youth even five people could not cope with her, but after they met, she became softer. After some time, the woman noticed the guests and greeted them, but they had no time to talk as more and more zombies appeared. Uncle Huang and Uncle Nu warned everyone that a huge crowd of zombies was approaching from the west. Hearing this, the guy got angry and he was ready to fight. In his previous life, his entire family suffered due to a sudden zombie attack. But now everyone is ready and will not leave these creatures even a chance to win. The guy was sure that they would definitely survive because he did not fight alone and all his relatives were nearby. The zombies were infecting more people and were going to lay siege to their home. Joe was sure that someone was controlling these creatures. Looking up, he saw the figure of a man standing alone in the distance. This figure was none other than Lin. He was somehow able to survive. The battle dragged on, but the zombies did not decrease. They continued to attack their house. They had already used up all the explosives and the situation was getting more complicated. The zombies were everywhere and the guy felt that they had tactics. Since the zombies had been advancing for a long time, everyone was tired from such a long battle. At a rapid pace, zombies filled everything around. Joe tells everyone to go to the courtyard and hold the defense there and he will take over the rest. The next moment, a crowd of zombies attacked him and a mountain formed. The guy activated the Bloody Buddha ability and destroyed all the zombies. He felt his blood boiling in his body and a force awakening that could destroy everything in its path. He had seen in his previous life how one commander of the Dawn Army had the same ability. Somehow his Blood Buddha ability was much weaker, but that didn't matter at the moment, since he had to deal not with a crowd of zombies, but with the one who controls them. Meanwhile, everyone fought with the zombies and did not let them go further. Auntie covered Bing Bing's back and asked if she was okay since she was injured before. The girl thanks for the help and asks where Joe ran away to. Zhou Ying replies that her brother is now definitely crushing all the zombies left and right. She adds that there is no need to worry as her brother is safe and unharmed. Turning back, she saw a destroyed wall and a lying man. The lying person was Joe. He shouted to everyone not to come near and to run away from here as quickly as possible. The one who sent him flying and forced him to break through the wall was a huge zombie bear. The guy did not want to give up. He knew that he had to fight to the end. Joe could not allow that situation to happen again. He had to protect those he cared about. The young man stood up. He wanted more power. A strong wind blew. Everyone was worried about the guy. Joe went on the offensive with renewed vigor. He wanted to win as quickly as possible. But suddenly Derek appears. He stops the bear's huge paw with one hand. The guy adds that it took him time far away in the mountains to get used to this power. Derek decided to show his younger brother how to use such power. The bear flew several meters, kicking up dust and stones along the way. But the monster is not dead, so Derek tells Cho to mind his own business and then he can handle it himself. The young man was glad to see his older brother and says that he leaves everything to him. After some time, the young man looked at his opponent with coldness in his eyes. In front of him stood the renewed Lin, who threw away the pitiful human body. The man felt like a king. He not only retained his sanity, but also could control a crowd of zombies. Lin thanks the guy for cutting the zombie wolf into small pieces. Only with his help was he able to easily get the core and eat it. The next moment, Joe cuts Lin in half. The guy says that he is too talkative for a coward, and he is tired of listening to his monologues. 
The young man is indignant at Lin's pride in calling himself king. Joe thought that the pressure of the zombies on the family should lessen, since there was no one left to control them. But suddenly he heard laughter behind him. The man was not dead yet. Lin says that a measly knife cannot kill him. The guy immediately realized that the man had been given the ability to regenerate that wolf. Lin became very fast. Joe didn't even see his movements as he appeared behind him. The mutant says that resistance is useless and he will kill them all, and then they will join his army. It is precisely because people are just cattle that he brought zombies here to clean out this place. Meanwhile, the hole in the wall was sealed with a sheet of steel, and the zombies kept pushing with more force. Uncle New was already at the limit of his strength and said that if this continues, he will not be able to stand it. Jack said to wait a little longer until his sons figured everything out. Suddenly, a huge zombie bear falls onto the temporary wall. The next moment, Derek appears and says that although the battle was difficult, now these beasts can close any gap. But Derek could not go to the aid of his brother, since there were still a lot of zombies. He believed that Joe could handle everything. Meanwhile, Joe's battle with the mutant was not in his favor. The difference in strength was colossal. Lin won easily and was upset by the guy's weakness. Suddenly, the guy stood up and swung a knife at the zombie. Joe was furious that Lin didn't care about him. He was ready to kill him because he wanted to raise his hand against his family. Although the zombie was injured, he recovered before our eyes with unimaginable speed. A second later, he lunged and attacked the guy with his claws. The mutant zombie had not only great speed and regeneration, but also by force, which did not require proof. The guy was injured, which meant that the effect of the bloody Buddha's ability did not work. Lin had at least a little fun because he thought that his claws would immediately reach the internal organs. Joe realized that his stamina was declining too quickly, and he would not be able to maintain his ability for long. This meant that the next attack would determine the outcome of the battle. Lin himself did not know the limit of his power, and a moment later he inflicted another wound on the guy. A grenade appeared from the guy's sleeve, and he threw it right at the zombie's face. Upon contact, an explosion occurred and smoke rose. Lin laughed and said that an ordinary grenade would not kill him. But looking around, he realized that Joe had fled with his tail between his legs. The man laughed because running away was useless, because he could find him by the smell of blood. He added that Joe could run as long as he wanted, but in the end, he would kill him. Meanwhile, the young man hid in the store, catching his breath and healing his wounds. Somehow, with the help of bandages, he managed to stop the bleeding, and the fact that his ability helped heal wounds was a pleasant surprise. But despite this... His forces were running out, and they were only enough for one attack. Outside, Lin came to the smell of Joe's blood. He was surprised that the guy chose a gas station store as the grave site. The man immediately saw a trap consisting of gasoline, a wire rope, and a grenade. He laughed at the guy's stupidity, as he had no intention of falling into the trap. He felt that he did not need to enter the room, since the most pungent smell of blood came from above. The man was surprised because only the guy's jacket fell from the roof. The moment the jacket fell, Joe appeared right in front of Lin. He threw a handful of salt right in the mutant's face. The zombie immediately screamed in pain. He did not expect the sudden attack. The guy says it's just salt. Can't he smell it? He also adds that he will not see or feel anything, since since he adopted the abilities of the zombie wolf, he also received his weaknesses. There are a lot of olfactory cells in the noses of wolves, and when the nasal cavity is irritated, he probably now feels incredible pain. He adds that everyone will lower their guard, believing that they have seen through the enemy's trap, and Lin is not a king, but just a pathetic zombie. The next moment, the mutant tries to kill the guy, but nothing works out for him since he missed his chance. Joe gathers all his power and concentrates it in his hands, just as his brother had shown him before. The zombie saw in front of him the huge aura and power of the guy, which he had collected in a short time. Joe says goodbye to the monster and strikes him. A huge impulse of force attacked the man at once and broke the ground. But even such a blow could not cut the mutant's body. The next moment, the pit in which Lin lay began to fill with gasoline. The monster did not understand what was happening. Joe says that he decided to try to use the entire supply of the gas station, since ordinary grenades do not work on him. The guy says that this station will be the site of Lin's grave. Having said goodbye, he throws a grenade straight into the pit. People heard a loud explosion that rang throughout the village. Derek asked his father if everything was okay. 
He replies that everything is fine, looking at the huge cloud of smoke rising to the sky. When the smoke cleared, the sun illuminated the area with bright rays. The zombie crowd retreated because they were afraid of sunlight. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief as they managed to survive this stormy night. They were very happy about their first triumphant victory. Joe, returning home, was also very happy since all his relatives were safe and sound. Suddenly, behind him, he hears a girl calling him. She asks for help, and the next second she falls from loss of consciousness. This girl was familiar to the guy. Her name was Layla. Sometime later at home, Joe Ying tells his brother that he is a pervert because he began to undress the girl right in the middle of the street. The guy says he just wanted to make sure the girl wasn't bitten, since their own safety comes first. He also adds that he himself was without a t-shirt, to which his sister replies that this is certainly the answer of a pervert. He was lucky that Bing Bing didn't see it and she was there to stop him. The guy doesn't understand what his sister is talking about. At this moment, Bing Bing comes out of the room and says that Layla's condition is normal. She will recover after sleep. There was silence in the corridor and the girl who had just appeared did not understand what was going on. Immediately, Joe Ying comes to his senses and says that everything is fine. Joe picks up and thanks the girl for her help. Bing Bing is embarrassed and says that she didn't do anything special. A company of three people gathered to check if there were survivors and said goodbye. Suddenly, the young man shouts at Bing Bing not to blame herself for the deaths of others. Because even with all the precautions, the wave of zombies could not be stopped. He adds that the most important thing is to move forward. Finally, the sadness disappeared from the girl's face. She smiled and said that he was right. Derek, who was sitting in the car, said that Joe had finally become an adult. The young man tells his brother that this time everything will definitely be different. The guys got into the car because they had to get rid of all the corpses. Outside the city, they piled up and burned a bunch of corpses. They had to be burned since animals that eat them could also mutate. Derek says he wants to sleep and Cho will have to drive the car back himself, as well as fill up the tank and wash the car. The young man awkwardly says that there is no more gas station. He also adds that he doesn't want to wash the car just because his older brother said so. Then Derek suggests playing a game of demon hunting. Instead of rock, paper, scissors, the two brothers came up with this game themselves. They loved it since childhood. The rules were very simple. The hunter stood still for 10 seconds. The demon's task was to run as fast as he could. If the hunter catches the demon in three minutes, he wins. 10 seconds later, Derek appears behind Cho and says that he can do it too. But the younger brother suddenly changes direction and dodges the grab. Two brothers chased each other at high speed throughout the forest. Suddenly, Joe decides to climb a tree. He made a jump while running. But suddenly, the tree under his foot disappears. In fact, it simply fell over and he was unable to jump on it. Derek used his ability and forcefully knocked the tree to the ground. The guy landed next to a fallen tree and turned back. He saw a tree log flying towards him, so he blocked it with his hand. Derek stood on the other side and applied pressure, thereby driving Cho into a trap. The guy could hardly hold on since the difference in their strength was high and it was not easy to surpass it. After a short time, there was nowhere to retreat and the guy found himself in a dead end. The next moment, the log exploded under simultaneous pressure from both sides. Derek comes to his senses and says that he went a little too far. He asks if everything is okay with Cho. But looking ahead, he saw no one. The young man sat upstairs and said that victory was his as three minutes had passed. Derek asks how the guy managed to get there. Joe replies that he simply pushed off the rock. He did not expect such a difference in strength. Derek asks how he got his powers. Since he ate the core himself, he thought that his brother did the same. The guy doesn't answer directly and says that his ability is like an effect of borrowing power, although in a past life he actually ate the core. Derek says that Cho can borrow his ability, but their powers are different. The young man says that he is almost right and suggests calling his ability the Bloody Buddha. And this ability increases speed, strength, and protection from physical damage, but so far Joe only understands 70% of the ability. Derek says he put the zombie bear core in the desk drawer in Cho's room as it was better to be prepared for anything. The brothers did not know that someone behind the tree was eavesdropping on their conversation. As night falls in Joe's room, Joe Ying entered the room while her brother was sleeping. She was looking for the zombie core. By finding the core and absorbing it, she will finally gain superpower too. The next morning, the weather was sunny, and the birds were bathing in the sun's rays. Joe plowed the land in order to grow crops for the future. 
The guy didn't want to work, but again, as the youngest son, his mother forced him. The young man thought that his mother was biased, since his brother was definitely free, but only he worked. In other respects, Joe was also not ordinary, so he used his ability and began to cultivate the soil. Layla stood outside, gathering her thoughts to approach the guy. The girl was wearing only one white shirt, and one might say she looked seductive. In the end, the girl decided to come around the corner and called out to the guy. Looking ahead, she was surprised by the scene that appeared before her. Joe turned around and asked the girl if everything was okay. Layla says she just wanted to thank the guy for saving her. The young man said that he was simply fulfilling a promise he had made long ago, and she did not owe him anything. The beauty says that it doesn't matter. She pours tea and asks the guy to help her again in the future. After listening to her, Joe refused her offer. He was not interested in it. The girl did not expect such a sharp answer. She asked the reason for his refusal. The guy says that he promised to help because Uncle Lee took care of his family, and he simply returned the debt. But now that the debt is paid, he has no reason to help the girl every time. Layla was very upset. She looked down and said with difficulty that she understood. After some time, Joe finally cleared away all the dirt he created when plowing the land. The young man realized that the blood Buddha was not yet suitable for agricultural work, and he needed to improve his control over the ability. Suddenly he hears a knock on the gate and opens it. It turns out that guests have come to him. After they described the situation in the village, the guy listened to them and hung his head and said that nothing could be done. Unfortunately, no one else survived in the village, and everyone was saddened by this news. The guests blamed themselves for the deaths of others because they felt responsible. But Joe says that they are not to blame and did everything in their power. Uncle New asks what they should do next, since they didn't know how to improve the situation. The guy says that everything is simple. They need to take a shower first and then have dinner together. Because no matter what happens, the most important thing is that they are still alive and well. After a while, Bing Bing came out of the bathroom with wet hair. The clothes that Zhou Ying gave her were not enough for her, and the girl thought that she looked strange in them. At this moment, the girl was called to dinner as the food was already ready. The girl was a little embarrassed because she looked strange, but she thought that there was nothing wrong with it. By evening, when the sun was already setting below the horizon, throughout the entire village only one house had a light on. Preparations for the evening meal were in full swing in the kitchen. Everyone was talking and joking. Aunt Olivia tells Bing Bing to sit next to Joe, to which the girl happily agrees. Layla watched with envy as the girl sat down, but could not say anything against it. Joe offered the girl a soda with a smile, and she took it. Jack raised his glass and said that now at this table are all the survivors in the village. Communication has not yet been restored, and they do not know how things are in other places. But they all must survive at any cost. They have already survived a wave of zombies. This meant that they became one big family, and they had to help each other in difficult times. And also, they must not only survive, but also live in prosperity and well-being. Everyone raised their soda after such a speech and decided to drink to a bright future. Suddenly, the drink falls out of Zhou Ying's hands and she falls out of her chair. Derek immediately stands up and asks how she is feeling. The girl sweated profusely. Her eyes turned red and a barely audible roar escaped her mouth. With one glance, Joe realized that something was wrong with his little sister. The next moment, the sister suddenly stood up and attacked the guy with a scream. She grabbed his hand with her teeth but the guy was ready for this and activated his ability in advance. Everyone was surprised by the girl's behavior and were at a loss as to what was happening. The father tells his daughter to unhook from her brother and he will settle everything if there is any disagreement. Behind the man, Layla was very frightened by this behavior, as if she had not seen this scene for the first time. Finally, Zhou Ying's impulse began to weaken and the girl began to come to her senses. The guy asks how she is. The girl came to her senses and stepped back. She looked at the perplexed eyes of the others. Everyone was perplexed, and the father asked his daughter what it was. She was confused and did not know what to answer. Zhou Ying was embarrassed by the large number of eyes fixed on her and asked her brother to help her. The guy suddenly stabs his sister in the stomach. She did not expect such a turn of events. Taking his sister with him, Joe said that she had drunk too much soda and needed to clear her head. Everyone looked with slight fear and surprise. They were simply speechless. On the street, Zhou Ying burst into tears because she realized that she had just almost attacked her family. 
The guy scolds his sister for her rashness and says that she is very lucky that after eating the kernel, she remained alive at all. The girl apologizes and says with sadness in her voice that she also wanted to have superpower. This time, even with the experience from his past life, Joe was truly taken by surprise by his sister. He didn't even know what would have happened if he hadn't sensed something was wrong from the very beginning. The guy sighed and put his hand on his sister's head and said that he would teach her to use the new power. To begin with, she must close her eyes and think of the force as a flow of air that filled her body. The ability was already part of her, part of her instincts. And now, having this ability, she must open the world anew. The girl opened her eyes, and the guy asks what she sees in front of her. Zhou Ying said that she sees the flow of life, and it seems that she could control this flow. She extended her hand to the plant in front of her, and it began to grow right before her eyes at great speed. The girl was very surprised that she accelerated the growth of the plant. Joe replies that apparently it is, and the sister asks if he can do the same. The man was very happy because he had only planted these potatoes during the day, but now with the girl's ability they don't have to worry about supplies. The girl was shocked by what she heard. She did not want her ability to be used for farming. She thought she could shoot laser beams, control thunder, or turn into a super girl. But in the end she is just a good farmer. Her brother was amazed at her imagination. Joe knew that by eating the core... The probability of awakening the ability was very small and the fact that his brother and sister received it was clearly not just luck. He thought it all had something to do with his ability. Morning came and as expected, the rooster tried to wake everyone up. But suddenly there was silence as Joe grabbed the bird by the neck and told him not to make any noise. The guy asks where Uncle New got the rooster from. The man replies that they also have a chicken. He personally raised them so that later she would lay eggs. A couple of years ago, the farm was short on workers, and he received a chicken and a rooster as a reward for his help. Hearing that there was a farm in the village, the guy immediately remembered that it was not so far away. Thus, they went to the main farm of the village and after some time arrived at their destination. Joe said they need to take as many birds as possible to breed them at home. And also take eggs with unborn chicks with you. Juan says that everyone on the farm is dead and asks if they will suddenly turn into zombies. Even though they looked like they had been stabbed to death, there was always the possibility of danger. The guy reassures them, saying that zombies do not appear in the middle of the day, but the main thing is not to go into the basement, where the sun's rays do not reach. Juan says they still don't know what's going on outside. He couldn't believe that all the people there were dead too. Uncle New replies that people have many effective weapons and maybe help will soon reach them. Joe says that it is better for them not to have high hopes. Because the worst thing is not the zombies themselves, but the virus, the consequences of which go far beyond the scope of human imagination. And they could only rely on themselves. After some time, Juan found an incubator and told her companions to look at their number. Uncle New was very happy about this discovery, since it meant the success of their foray. The guy asks the man if these eggs are suitable, to which he replies that it is possible, under the right conditions, to carry out artificial incubation, Juan says that there are a lot of eggs, but there are not a single chicken, and this is very strange. Joe agrees and says that if they all died, then at least the bodies would remain. Suddenly they hear a sound from the entrance and turn around to see what it was. It turns out that it was a goose. It made sounds characteristic of its species. Everyone was surprised by the sudden appearance of the goose. Juan was very glad that there were surviving animals on the farm. He asked Joe for a bag and said that he already had experience in catching birds for slaughter. The young man suspected something but decided to remain silent for now. Afterwards, the man began to carefully catch the goose and tie it up. He quickly managed to cope with the task and easily immobilized the goose. But suddenly the bird opened its beak and turned into a monster. Joe reacted in time and saved Huang from the zombie goose. The man started sweating and asked what it was, but they didn't have time to talk since they had to leave. Once outside, they stopped abruptly and were surprised by what they saw. A whole flock of hungry zombie monsters rushed towards them, who surprisingly were not afraid of the sun. It was very difficult to resist the birds, since there were so many of them. Joe, noticing the escape route, called the men behind him. They began to run away as fast as they could because they did not want to be eaten. The guy understood that Huang and Uncle Nu were too slow, and at this pace they would definitely not be able to break away from the mutated geese. The men were already out of breath from running and covered in sweat. 
the young man urgently needed to come up with something. There was nothing to do, so the guy decided to try a new ability that his sister had previously shown him. This power was different from the one his brother possessed, and was perhaps more practical. The young man used his growth ability, and vines began to emerge from all sides. They stretched out along the entire length and attacked the monsters who were constantly chasing people. The guy was glad that he managed to slow down his pursuers and said that they needed to break away. But unfortunately, the path ahead was blocked by more zombie geese. They were surrounded. They looked at the monsters' mouths and thought that they were finished, but Joe shouted at them to quickly run inside. They ran into the room and closed the door behind them, the men catching their breath. The man looked out the window and said that now they were stuck here for a long time. Even if Joe is strong enough to get out, he and Huang certainly won't be strong enough. The young man replies that it was due to his negligence that they were in danger, and he will do everything to ensure that they return unharmed. Joe thought through all the options, but was still hesitant to use the Blood Buddha's ability due to limitations. But suddenly, Juan finds a computer and says that the electricity on the farm is still not turned off. The guy doesn't understand how this information will help them in this situation. The man says that since the computer turns on and you can connect to the network, then you can find a way. Suddenly, monsters start breaking into the door. The guy blocked the door and told Juan to hurry up because the door wouldn't hold up for long. The man began to quickly type on the keyboard and asked for three more minutes. He was very confident that he would find something that would help them. Joe understood that in three minutes the door would definitely break down, and it was better for him to attack first. So he activated the ability and kicked the door out. He grabbed the handle of the broken door and looked at the monsters with rage. The zombie geese knew no mercy and fear. When they saw a man, they immediately attacked him. The guy began to clear a path forward, using the door as a shield in front of him. The next moment, he used the ability and struck with all his might, destroying all the monsters in front of him. The guy sighed, since with this he secured at least a couple of minutes. But turning his attention to the remaining mass, he realized that it was moving and trying to come together. Uncle New asks Huang how long he will continue to fuss, since judging by the sounds, it was not easy for Joe. He replied that there was still a little time left. He mentally asked Joe to hold out a little longer. Once the file is downloaded on your computer, everything will be over. Meanwhile, the guy was surprised by the sight of the creature that formed right in front of him. The next second, this monster rushed forward and attacked the guy. It had enormous power, and Joe's ability was not enough. The young man flew back, and from the strong push, his throat began to bleed. At that moment, Uncle New came out and told the guy to run away with Juan, and he would try to detain this monster. The guy got up and went to the man, who shouted at him not to hesitate, otherwise they would all die here. But the young man was adamant. He wanted to fulfill his promise that he would get them out of here at any cost. The mutant zombie began to attack the victims. Joe felt as if the energy of the growth acceleration and strength enhancement abilities were combined together. It was a strange feeling. It was as if his whole being wanted to win. The next moment, the guy hit with his fist, and the creature scattered to the sides. But immediately after that, his power dissipated. The guy was very surprised and glad that his idea worked after all. But he could not understand what this new power was. The blow was very powerful, so much so that now he could not move his hand. There was no time to recover as more zombie geese appeared around the corner. Joe was annoyed that there was no end to them, but he was also in a dangerous situation. The danger was approaching every second, and the guy could not move, as he had used up all his strength. Suddenly, music began to play throughout the village, and the zombie goose heard it and stopped a few centimeters from Joe. The melody was familiar to the monsters, and they ran back in a hurry. Juan leaves the room and asks if everything is okay with them. Uncle Nu, in response, asks if he turned on these sounds. The man replies that he really did. These sounds indicated the beginning of feeding on the farm. Since all the animals remembered this melody, they immediately ran to the feeding place. Fortunately, he made it in time, but they will never come to the farm again. They were very lucky that the chicken eggs did not break. Juan asks when the man managed to take them, to which he replies that while he was busy catching the goose, he managed to grab a few. Juan asks if these eggs are mutated. Uncle Nu replied that this cannot be, since these eggs are no more than a week old, and those monsters would not have time to lay them. Joe sat in the back of his pickup truck and thought about the new power he had recently unleashed. When they arrived home, they held a general meeting. 
Zhou Ying asks everyone to pay attention, as she wanted to outline the further plan of action. For starters, the security group, which is responsible for patrolling and building protective structures. It included Commander-in-Chief Jack Wan and Derek. Then the agriculture group is responsible for growing crops and raising livestock. It included Uncle Nu and the girl herself, since she had a very useful ability and, as a farmer, would do everything at the highest level. Next came the Resource Distribution Group, which kept records of the expenditure of supplies and resources and also planned their use. Olivia and Layla were in charge. And last but not least is the Intelligence Group, the eyes and ears that search for resources and analyze the environment. In this group were Joe and Bing Bing, Thus, the meeting was over and everyone had their role and task. After some time, the young man collected everything he needed in his bag for his foray outside. The guy took everything that could be useful, grenades, Molotov cocktails, first aid kit, weapons, since it was impossible to repeat the mistakes of the past. Suddenly, he hears someone calling him in a quiet voice. It was Layla. She quietly approached him and pressed herself against his back. The girl asked the guy to take her with him. The guy does not understand the reason for such a request. She tries to find the reason and says that she is afraid of Zhou Ying, as she can turn into a zombie. The girl adds that she just wants to go with the guy. She knew every corner of the village and could be useful. Layla says that there are plenty of supplies there and they can run away together. They will definitely be able to hold out until help arrives. The girl would rely on the guy for everything, and no one knew the place except her. Looking forward, the girl saw the guy's blood-curdling gaze in front of her. The guy was very attached to his family and did not tolerate any disrespect towards her, and the girl suggested that he leave his family. He says that if she says that again, she will fly out of their house. In addition, he reminds him that it was she who left him that time. Coming out of his room, the guy sees Bing Bing standing at the entrance. The girl was a little embarrassed and asked the guy if they could move out. Joe agreed and they left. After some time, they arrived at a small lake. There was a fishery here at a very great distance from the nearest settlement. Bing Bing says that because of this, there were probably few fishermen here and asks who opened this farm. Joe replies that this place belongs to that same guy, Lin, and he adds that he found this place by accident. The girl is interested in the reason for Lin's contempt for Joe. The guy replies that it all started in high school when he didn't want to obey someone just because of his family's money. And then Joe began to communicate closely with Layla, and Lin tried to show off in front of her every time in order to woo her. Bing Bing says that Lin didn't like Layla because he often insulted her in public. The guy said that Lin's goal was only to take revenge on him. And Layla is free to be with whomever she wants, despite the then rumors of their marriage. Joe says that it was the adults who planned to marry them since they communicated so closely without even asking them. The girl finally understood everything, although she did not understand how such love could lead to marriage. Suddenly the girl felt something, but there were no signs of danger on the water. They came to a garage and there was a large storage area in the basement. However, the passage defense was very high, like in a bank the girl asks the guy what to do next. The guy replies that they should try their luck anyway, but in fact, in a past life he was already here, hiding from zombies. He was able to hold out for a long time on supplies. But in the past, he came when the power was already out, and the guy managed to turn on the backup power source in time to prevent the food from spoiling. This time, there was no power outage. Perhaps something had changed due to the fact that they stopped the first wave of zombies. And there was a possibility that there were survivors here. Suddenly, he hears a girl scream and asks her what happened. She replies that everything is fine, and she was just not careful. Bing Bing says that fish heads are too strange and asks the guy what kind of fish they are. Suddenly, the fish's pupil twitched and turned crimson red. Joe rushed forward sharply as he immediately realized that these fish had mutated into zombies. As soon as the guy touched the fish, it hit him with a stream of water. The young man did not expect such a sharp and strong attack, and the next second he flew into the wall. Judging by the strength of the monster, the guy immediately realized that it was a second-rank zombie. Bing Bing stood in front of the guy, ready to protect him, and asks what they should do next. The guy shouts that they need to leave because they can't cope with the monster, but suddenly he hears a sound from the entrance. He was very surprised when the vault door closed and they were trapped. The guy took a knife out of his bag and rushed to attack, since they didn't have time to mess with the door. He had to deal with the danger first. 
Bing Bing could not help and watch the battles, hoping that the guy would cope. The knife cut into the scales of the fish, as if into iron armor, without cutting a drop. There was no way the guy could cut through these scales with force. The creature was completely covered in scales, but it must have a weak spot. After analyzing with his own eye, the guy realized that the weak point of zombies is the gills. Joe made a dash and found himself behind the zombie, and then pointed his knife at the weak point of the fish. But suddenly, when the knife was already very close, mutated worms appeared. They usually lived in the gills of fish and coexisted together, protecting the host in times of danger. The guy's attack failed, and the fish wasted no time in attacking him with its tail. The next moment, the guy flew to the side, receiving injuries. The fish immediately approached him and wanted to attack him with a stream of water. But the guy took an exposed cable with electricity and paralyzed the zombie with a discharge of static voltage. He was lucky that the creature had no resistance to pure energy. It was not an easy battle. The guy grinned at the fact that even though everything was different from his previous life. But basically, these were not key events. It was obvious that someone had deliberately placed this mutant in the vault. Bing Bing asks if the guy is safe, to which he replies that everything is fine and they need to return quickly since it is not safe here. Trying to turn the door handle, it did not yield to the girl's efforts. She was amazed that the door did not move at all, as if someone had locked it from the outside. Joe activated his powers and asks Bing Bing to step aside. The next moment he hits the door with his fist with all his might. After all the dust had settled, they saw that the door was safe and sound. The material of this door was as strong as a bank vault, and also underground. It was not easy to open it with brute force. Joe says that this was the strongest blow he could unleash at the moment, and apparently there is no way to open the door. The guy is tired and adds that he needs to rest a little. The girl tells the guy to rest and she will examine this place, perhaps there was another way out. Joe was resting, sitting in the corner near a pile of stones, when he suddenly opened his eyes. Since Bing Bing arrived depressed, she found nothing even though she looked through every corner. Unfortunately, there was no other option in this vault. The temperature in the storage facility was about minus 18, and even if they withstood the cold, they would sooner or later run out of oxygen. There was no time to hesitate, and the guy stood up, saying that he would try again. Suddenly, Joe notices the cannonball that the girl was holding. She asks him if she will gain powers like him if she eats it. The guy, worried about the girl, suddenly grabs her hand and says that this is too dangerous. She will not be able to use her ability constantly, and moreover, the effect is limited. Bing Bing says that if this continues, they will die here, so she asks the guy to let her risk her life. Take a risk and hope that he can survive, and the awakened ability will allow them to get out of here. Receptivity is the ability to awaken Bing Bing in a past life. He didn't know if anything would change this time because of the guy's intervention. Joe asks if she is sure he thought that since she showed courage, he should not be afraid either. Bing Bing says that in the past, she would have been scared, but now she is ready with him. It was already evening outside and the sun was setting. Jack and Derek searched for the missing, but no one responded to their call. Suddenly they hear a loud roar. Jack asks if the zombies should be afraid of the sun. Derek says they only appear at night, but something was clearly wrong here. The next moment they hear Juan scream and run towards him. They didn't know that someone was listening behind the tree. In his memories, Joe saw a destroyed city. The guy was on the roof of a destroyed building in a dream. A voice from the side wakes him up and asks him to wake up quickly. Opening his eyes and looking to the right, he sees a girl with a rifle in front of him. This girl was Bing Bing. She commanded him to get up because she had a job for him. She noticed four huge zombie dogs of the fourth rank and two tigers of the sixth rank. The guy said that because of them, a lot of zombies would gather here in about 20 minutes and they needed to notify the others. Bing Bing says that they won't make it in time and only if she can deal with the leader, she can gain some time. The guy does not agree and says that as a captain, there is no point in staying here. The girl says that Joe's abilities have not yet awakened and his presence will only interfere. The guy was saddened that after eating the zombie core, his ability had not yet awakened. The guy reluctantly tells the girl that she simply must survive. The girl smiled and nodded to the guy, and the sun's rays illuminated her beautiful face. Suddenly, the guy wakes up from his sleep as the girl woke him up. Waking up, the guy notices that something is wrong with the girl and asks why she is all on fire. 
Bing Bing herself doesn't understand what's happening, but it was hard for her to breathe. She sweated profusely and her whole body felt like it was on fire. The girl could no longer endure this heat. Joe asks to wait a little while he brings some ice. And he asks the girl to stop undressing. She replies that she can't and asks him not to look. The guy says that he didn't look and immediately turned away. After a while, he asks how she feels. Bing Bing says she feels much better. The next moment, she added that she saw zombies. There were a lot of them. Joe tells her not to panic, as that is her ability. The guy was convinced that he had no influence on anything, since the girl had this power in a past life. The girl says she sees a whole bunch of zombies underneath them. Joe is surprised by what he heard, as he did not know that there was something below. After searching a bit and moving the shelves aside, they found a secret passage down. There really was a staircase leading down. Having gone down, the girl asked what the smell is in this passage. The young man says that it is the smell of sulfur and that the Lin family used fishing as a cover to illegally store gunpowder. It was not surprising that all the doors and equipment were still working. Apparently, they had spent a lot of money. Suddenly, they hear the roar of zombies who were walking aimlessly around the room. Joe says that it is too dark here and he is counting on the girl who is surprised by such a statement. The guy took out a knife and encouraged Bing Bing, saying that they would succeed. The girl, after listening to him, activated her ability and became serious. She told him the zombie's location, and the guy at the same moment destroyed them, clearing the passage. Thus they continued to go deeper and neutralize all the attacking zombies. Finally, after some time, they reached a locked room and entered it. There were a lot of boxes and the girl asks what they should do next, since they have reached a dead end. After looking around, Joe said that if they swam through, they would end up right in the pond outside. So they blew dust through the pipe and into the waters of the pond. Bing Bing was very happy that they could finally get out. Suddenly a huge zombie fish appears next to the girl and grabs her. Joe grabbed the girl's hand and tried to pull her out of the monster's mouth. But despite all his efforts, water was not his element in the end. The grip weakened and the fish carried the girl away in its mouth. The guy watched Bing Bing lose again and couldn't let it happen again. This time he was not going to leave the girl alone. The young man activated his ability and kelp vines began to appear from the bottom. They grabbed the fish from all sides, but the monster resisted. The girl was running out of oxygen, but she saw Joe trying to save her. The last thing she saw was the guy holding out his hand to her. After some time on the surface, the girl opens her eyes. She jumps up abruptly and screams the guy's name. The guy turned around and was glad that the girl woke up. By that time, he had just heated up the canned food as they needed to refresh themselves and gain strength. The girl thanks the guy and asks what happened to that fish. Joe replies that she probably became food for the rest of the mutants. He adds that she was more difficult to deal with than the monster in the vault. However, most likely, those mutated fish have already spread to other places and will be encountered again in the future. Bing Bing says that during university, the guy was quiet and she thought that he would be difficult to get along with. But since the zombie invasion, he has saved her from danger more than once. The girl was a little embarrassed and asked why he was so kind to her. Joe was honest with her and said that he saved her first because of her ability, because she would help him to protect his family. The girl was a little upset, but was grateful for the honesty. Bing Bing asks why he saved her this time. The young man was silent for a long time, not knowing what to say and when he began to speak. The girl stopped him and, turning away, asked when they were returning. Joe says that they need to move out right now and thanks to her ability they will be able to avoid collisions with zombies. Finally, in the middle of the night, they returned home. My little sister ran out and hugged her brother. She was very worried about him. The guy sees that the girl is worried and asks what happened while he was away. Joe Ying fell silent and then suggested that they go inside first. At home, Juan was sitting on a chair. He was infected with the virus and was trying to escape. Joe was stunned by this event and asked how it happened. Derek said that when they went looking for them, they came across zombies lurking along the way. He wanted to find a rank two core to save Huang, but he failed. Uncle Niu asks if there is anything else that can be done. But it was already too late, since the virus had reached the brain, and if you give it the core, it will simply turn into a monster like Lin. Juan had difficulty pronouncing the words, but if you listened, you could understand that he did not want to become a zombie. He shouted to the guy not to doubt and decide quickly. 
Joe understood that there was no choice, and he would have to be neutralized. Suddenly, he remembers something, and there was still hope. He turns around and asks Olivia, his mother, to come with him. He took out the core of the zombie fish and told it to quickly eat it. The woman asks where he got it, to which the guy replies that he got it on a sortie. He hurried her so that she would quickly eat the colonel. The mother says that she is not infected and does not understand why her son asks her for this. At this moment, he hears a roar, and Derek says that he will not be able to hold Juan for long. Joe understood that something urgently needed to be done before his mother's ability awakened. At this moment, the zombie breaks the ropes and frees itself from its shackles. He asks Joe to kill him quickly before it is too late. The guy mentally apologizes to Brother Juan and was ready to strike. The zombie was also mentally prepared and no longer resisted. At that moment, Olivia activated her ability. She immediately used her ability and healed the zombies. Juan became human again. He was very happy. Everyone was surprised that Olivia suddenly awakened her ability and began to look many years younger. The girl didn't understand why everyone was staring at her like that. After some time of explanation from Cho, everyone understood where Olivia got her ability. Zhou Ying was delighted that thanks to her ability, her mother became a beauty. Derek asks if she can turn all the zombies into normal people now. But Zhou said that this ability can only heal those who have not completely transformed, and ordinary zombies will simply die. Jack was very happy that they could not be afraid of infection, since his wife would now save everyone. Olivia asks her son how he knew that she would have such an ability. Joe couldn't explain it, but he said that he suddenly felt that she would be the one to have the right ability. In addition, this was the case with the abilities of the brother and sister, but then the feeling was not so strong. Although the young man did not sense Bing Bing's ability and could not borrow her power. Perhaps he could only copy the abilities of his family, and when they awakened the abilities, the guy became stronger. Some time later, Bing Bing and Joe were in the living room. The guy asks the girl to find out how many zombies are in the area. She agrees and activates her ability, scanning the area around her. She says that there are about a hundred zombies in the forest and the same number at the foot of the mountain. The young man asks if there are any rank two zombies among them. The girl nods affirmatively and says that she sees at least three. Suddenly, Bing Bing notices that all the zombies began to move and were moving at the same time. It was as if they were gathering in one place at someone's call. Suddenly, the girl screams, seeing Lin. All the zombies were heading towards him. The guy saw with his own eyes how he was torn into pieces and doubts that the girl saw him. If it really is Lin, then he is the one who locked them in the vault. And also attacking Juan and the others was part of his plan. Bing Bing asks what to do next. Perhaps he should inform the others to be careful. The guy says that Lin is probably now gathering a bunch of zombies to attack them. But instead of waiting for him to attack, they would attack first and take him by surprise. 